This is Launching Your Daughter Podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole Burgess, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Now, here is today's episode. Episode 3. Today's guest is Laura Reagan, LCSWC. She is a certified Daring Way facilitator and has a private practice located in Severna, Maryland. She also has a podcast called Therapy Chat. She specializes in working with adults who have experienced some childhood relational trauma, such as emotional or physical neglect, physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, or who have witnessed domestic violence. On today's episode, we are discussing how her certification as a Daring Way facilitator not only assists her in the group work she conducts, but how it has helped her become a better clinician and how she uses it in individual therapy. Laura's website and podcast information will be on my show notes. I will also have Brene Brown's books on my resource page on my website. Now here is today's episode. Welcome. Today we have Laura Reagan, LCSWC, on the show today, and I'm so excited that you are here today, Laura. Thank you, Nicole. I'm so glad to be here. So I want to start out today, and we're going to talk, I know you um, have been trained in Brene Brown's work, and I, I really am excited to hear more about you being a certified Daring Way facilitator and how that helps not only um, women, but parents and kids. And I would love it if you could just ex- explain that a little more. Yeah, well, I, I really loved Brene Brown's talks, her TED Talks and her books, when I discovered her, you know, I guess as therapists, we, we want to know more. We want to know more, do research. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm like, what's everything she's got going on? And um, looking her up online and I realized, oh, my gosh, she has a training program. And I just wanted, I was like, I've got to do it. I mm-hmm. want to learn this method. And, you know, I really didn't even know for sure what it was. Mm-hmm. I think – People may be familiar with Brene Brown, but they haven't always heard of, quote unquote, the daring way. Yes, yes. But it's a shame resiliency model. And it's, you know, kind of identifying the ways that shame shows up in your life. And, you know, there's a piece of it that can be connecting where that came from. And how you can develop resiliency to shame because we all have shame about certain things in our lives, but how can you show up in your relationships where you're being your authentic self? You're allowing yourself to be vulnerable. Um, as a parent, Mm -hmm. parenting is very vulnerable. I mean, we want to have all the answers as parents. We don't want to do it wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kids, challenge us and bring up all these emotions for us that if you can allow yourself to be vulnerable and admit you're not perfect, what a great thing to model for your kids. Absolutely. Yeah. Because when we're like, you know, don't question me. Hi, I'm the master, you know, (laughs) Uh (laughs) I mean, that's not authentic because we know we don't really feel that way inside and kids don't respond well to it. And if they go around acting like that, they're not going to do, they're not going to really thrive in life because people aren't going to connect with them. Right. And I think that, uh, that also speaks to just the humanness of that being imperfect and not knowing everything. And that's okay. I mean, there's, there's no way that we're going to know everything. We just can't. Exactly. And with kids, you know, what I see now, I mean, I have a son in college and a daughter who's in her, she's finishing her junior year of high school right now. Mm -hmm. Um, In our community, and I see with my own kids, there's so much pressure. Yes. You know, academic achievement, sports achievement, even, you know, citizenship, like just, you got to be the best at everything. You got to volunteer all the time. You got to be a leader. You got to be, get straight A's and, 
go to the right college, have a great career, get out there and make a lot of money. I mean, it's so intense. Yes. So being able to model that you're not perfect, you don't need to be perfect, I'm not perfect, no one is, it's okay. It's good to do your best, but you don't have to think that you have to be perfect to be okay. Yes. And that that speaks to a lot of the teen girls that I work with, that pressure you're talking about. It seems like over the last maybe five to 10 years, it's intensified even more. And it started more in middle school now versus high school. And I see a lot more um, anxiety and depression due to that internal pressure for the, that they create themselves, but also the external pressure from the world or society. And it is, it's really trying to be mindful of that and unlearn that, yes, I don't have to be perfect and I am enough. Right. And I agree with you about the past five to 10 years. I'm not sure how old you are, but you are. But when I was growing up, we had cameras, we took pictures, but it wasn't that every minute of your life is documented and every experience you have gets captured on film and well, not film on <laughs> digital. Yeah. And you know, with our phones now, you always have a camera with you. Mm-hmm. And when you see the kids, I mean, it's not just take a picture to capture this moment so I can remember it forever. You have to look good in the picture. Mm-hmm. And you know, they'll take the picture over and over and over and over and over and over and over until yes. they get it right. They don't think twice about it. Mm-hmm. I remember when I was in high school, like I didn't know how to really smile and what my best angle was for a photo. <laughs> I felt awkward and you yeah. know, stand there and just have this like frozen smile did not feel comfortable to me. And so a lot of times I wouldn't be smiling or You know, and I never really liked the way I looked in the pictures. I felt Mm -hmm. really Mm self-conscious. I think a lot of those are normal teenage feelings. But now there's an expectation that you better look good and edit that picture. You know, make sure your teeth are really white. You know, shave an inch or two off that waist. Mm -hmm. If you look through Instagram or Visco is one that a lot of the teenagers use. You'll see that same camera smile in every picture. And it's like, you can't tell anything about the experience that person was having if you right. really think about it. Right. Yeah, it's it's plastered on now. It's like I have to now, every picture, I have to keep going back to that same look or same smile. And it it feeds then the insecurities and the the external validation to say I'm enough versus going back to, no, I am enough on my own. I don't need somebody to tell me I'm okay. Yeah, because you're a soul in that body. Right. You're, it's not the outside that matters. And we know that. But I mean, it becomes this weird, like, teen girls now have kind of an expectation that they're supposed to look like models. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I think, you know, when we were younger, it's like, sure, there are unrealistic expectations of women's beauty ideals. Right. But in high school, you know, the girls that my daughter, her peers and, and my clients peers, they all it's you have to look a certain way. And they don't it's not conscious, right? Right. It, because it's just ongoing. It's just there. Yeah, it's that you, you matter if you look a certain way. Mm-hmm. If you don't look a certain way, you kind of don't matter. And you're invisible. Mm-hmm. Or you should just go away because you're kind of messing up the picture. You don't look right. Yep. You know? Yep. And that's so harmful for anyone to feel like how they look on the outside makes a difference for their worth as a person. Correct. And then transfer that then as we go into the you know parenthood. So, you know, if you're experiencing this as a teen girl and then you became a mom and still believing that you need to look a certain way, that you're not enough if you don't fit in or look or smile, you know, the best – then that's going to get transferred into the adulthood and then relating back to the next generation. Absolutely, Nicole. I see so many women in my practice whose mothers hated their own bodies Mm -hmm. and the daughters grew up hearing their mothers hating their bodies and just automatically started hating their bodies too. Mm -hmm. I talk to people who are in their mid to late 40s, early 50s, and when they really 
get down to it and try to understand what that inner critic is saying. Mm -hmm. It's their mom's voice. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, what would my mom think about my choice to do this? Or I know my mom wouldn't like it that I'm doing that. And, you know, you have to, I mean, we love our families and you want to, you want to be, make your parents proud, but you have to live your life for yourself. Right. So it sounds like as a, you know, a Daring Way facilitator, then you're doing not only holding the the mom, the dad, or the, the teen where they are, you're also doing a lot of education about what that looks like and how that impacts them. So they start to have a different understanding or be able to kind of change the old belief systems that they were taught. Right. It is a psychoeducational model that can be used clinically. So a lot of coaches use it and a lot of therapists use it. Okay. So the way I use the Daring Way in my practice is I mainly work with, I work with children, teens, and adults, but I would use the Daring Way more with teens and adults. And it's a, it's a model that's made to be done with groups because the yeah. emphasis is on connection mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, you know, shame resiliency. So if you're, if you're talking about shame in a session with your therapist, that's great, but you're still only you and the therapist are seeing it. Yes. If you're in a group and people who you can relate to are sharing their experience of never feeling like their mom thought they were good enough or their dad or the community they lived in, and you feel that way too. I mean, that's extremely powerful. Yes. Yeah. Because then you're, as you're saying, that group setting really being held and not, and knowing you're not alone in this um, can be very transformative. Absolutely. It really is. It's so powerful. And so I do use the Daring Way individually and I also offer groups. So, um, but I use it with my individual clients because of, uh, as you know, my practice is primarily working with people who've experienced some kind of childhood relational trauma. So emotional neglect, emotional abuse, physical neglect, physical abuse, mm -hmm. sexual abuse, or witnessing domestic violence. And a lot of the people who contact me to work with the Daring Way, you know, they love Brene Brown's work and they love, they hear you know, her words and say, that's me, that's my experience. Mm -hmm. But when they contact me to sign up for the group, they may have a lot of unprocessed trauma. Mm -hmm. And the shame resiliency work in a group, if you were doing it with your with a lot of unresolved trauma, it could really take you to a dark place. Right. So I feel it's very important to work on the trauma first. And when you've got it to a point where, you know, it may still be there, it may not be completely resolved, but you're confident in working with the therapist and you know where things are, um, it's safer to do the group work yes. at that stage. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, yeah, as you're saying, you could not have dealt with the trauma before can really you can unravel a little bit in a group setting and needing that additional support to work through some of it, then doing the group work. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it can kind of blindside you because you mm -hmm. don't know what's really deep in there. And once you start doing the shame work, it, it hits you, but it's so hard and fast. Yeah. You don't know which way is up. Right, right. So I'm curious, that kind of goes into the next question then. Because if you've got people that are coming to you saying, hey, I want to do this group work, but they don't necessarily, they've not done some of the trauma work or their own therapy, what are some of the, I guess, common concerns or maybe fears that if you suggest doing some therapy first, what typically comes up for the parents or even the, the teens um, about that? For my groups, I only do them right now with adults. Okay. So... Um, and the teens aren't typically the ones who are going to approach me and say, I love Brene Brown's work because I think, um, although it works great with teens, it's a really wonderful model to use with teens. I just don't think they're as likely to hear about it. Mm -hmm. It's more of something that 
people, you know, tend to hear about who are more in their 30s, 40s, not always, but right, just in right. general. So, um, you know, because I mean, teens aren't like buying books that are in the self-help department, you know. <laughs> true. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Sometimes, but not not usually. So um, when adults contact me about the group and they they love Brene Brown and they want to do The Daring Way, I think the biggest barrier to doing individual therapy instead or before. I think when they hear her talk, they're like, this is it. This is me. This is what I need to do. I want to get this. But they're hoping that it'll be something that can be kind of fast. So I think one of the things that makes that work really resonate is when you haven't been someone who's willing to give yourself the time and attention, you know, you just, you haven't been familiar with the experience of just examining your own life and really saying, how do I feel? What do I like? I mean, if you are really worried about, if you are falling into perfectionistic behaviors and people pleasing, then you probably are someone who you're used to putting other people first Mm -hmm. and yourself last. So making a commitment to doing some deep trauma work in therapy can seem pretty, you know, like, wow, I don't know if I want to do all that. I was just hoping to come to this group, maybe do an intensive and, you know, and it's, it's not being lazy or trying to take a shortcut. It's just that, you know, giving yourself that much focus and care and nurturing might just be foreign to you. So I think that's what both in The Gifts of Imperfection and in Daring Greatly, Brene Brown talks about how, you know, she had her breakdown mm-hmm. and then she crosses it out and says spiritual awakening. Um, and so she's like, okay, I got to go get therapy. And so she walks into the therapist's office with her spreadsheet and, you know, she's like, all right, so let's, you know, get this done. And therapist is like, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I mean, I, that's a, a, that's a way of showing up that really resonates for a lot of the people who become my clients that they're yeah. like, all right, well, you know, what do you think? Like six to eight sessions and we'll get this out of the way and then I can do the group. And <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm not going to say, oh yeah, just six to eight sessions. You'll be good to go. Cause right. you know, the work I'm doing with people is deeper and it yes. doesn't happen that quick once they can really realize that you're worth it, this is something that's been showing up in your life the whole time. And you just don't think that it can get better, but it can. Mm -hmm. And if you give yourself this, you know, you will be transformed and then you can go and do the group and be transformed again, you know, and it's beautiful, but yeah, you know, it's not just a like, all right, well, let's get this done, get it over with so I can, you know, move on to the next thing. That you summed it up beautifully, like what the benefits are. And, and I find a lot with the moms that I work with, it, it goes back to the, not investing in themselves because they are so much in the caregiver role mm-hmm. um, that when they allow themselves just to be present and to go deeper, they really, they, they shine again and they fe- they find themselves again. And that when they set time for themselves and do some of the inner work and have their own downtime and all of that, it then helps their whole entire family and their role modeling again to the next generation, whether it's their their daughters or their sons, that self-care, the inner work, giving yourself permission to be your best you versus having to yeah perform or do something or be perfect for the outside world. It's just, yeah the huge transformation for the moms and, and for families. So, yeah, exactly. And, and what people find when they do this work, and this is why I love it so much is that they can have deep, meaningful connection with the people in their lives that, you know, they didn't realize was missing, but people will so often say, I have a lot of friends, but I don't have anybody who I think really knows me. Mm Mm-hmm. And I don't know them. Yeah. And I want to. I feel empty because I, there's no one I can talk about about what's really on my mind. Mm-hmm. And even sometimes in their relationships with their spouses, um, you know, and this is men and women. I don't work with only women. Right. 
you know, they're like, I don't know what it would be like to have a deep connection with my partner. Like I've never felt that, Mm -hmm. but they can do it. They can get it. It can happen. And even with the person doing their individual work, I'm a social worker. We talk about systems theory. Whenever there's a change in the system, the whole system changes. Yes. When that one person is doing their work in therapy, they start to communicate, communicate differently. They start Mm -hmm. to ask for what they need and people, you know, their partner's like, you need, Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) And then it gives them permission to be a little bit more vulnerable and say, sometimes, you know, I'm lonely or sometimes I'm scared, you know, Mm -hmm. especially for men when some, all of our stereotypes in our culture about how men are supposed to be, yes, you know, strong, don't, don't feel sad, you know, exactly protect your whole family and, you know, all of these things, that's a lot of pressure. Right. And for, you know, a man to be able to say, I worry so much about losing my job because I'm the, you know, I'm the biggest breadwinner in our family and I would be completely devastated if our family, our lifestyle changed or we couldn't support, we had to move to a smaller house or something like that. And I mean, the shame that's in feeling that way. Yeah. And they can't talk about it. Right. And then what all your friends do is brag about their new boat or their new car and, you know, who got new granite countertops in their kitchen. You know, it's just, it leads to more isolation, less connection. And they're joking around talking about sports, but no one feels seen and heard. Right. Right. So not only do they start to gain a deeper connection to themselves and finding out what their values are, what their needs are, they then can communicate that and create those deeper connections with family members, friends, loved ones. And that's exactly what you're talking about, that this this model helps um, gain that deeper understanding and, and it can help the person feel more loved and belong belonging. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you can do that, you can do it with your kids. So you can help them feel seen and heard and maybe they yeah. won't grow up feeling yep. like they're not enough. And that that then that goes circles right back to what we had talked about earlier that that pressure the kids are feeling these days that when they see their parents role modeling that they are enough that helps take that external pressure down that they know that no I get to be my true self and what works for me not what society thinks I need to be or who where I need to go or do Yeah. And just to say something about one of Brene's other books, her newest book, Rising Strong, she really talks about in that book how, you know, it's about when you do fall. And we all do. It's not (laughs) just like, oh, I hope this never happens to me. I mean, there are (laughs) experiences in life that, you know, feel like a devastating fall. And instead of just how do you rebound from that, it's how does the process of falling change and transform you? And what is that process yeah. like? And how do yeah. you get through that? Oh, good stuff. Oh, my gosh, good stuff. Yeah, I love this work. And it really has transformed my practice. I mean, I would say the biggest way that it helps me in working with teens, because I don't do the model just like, step by step with them or with anyone in individual work. We, you know, it's, it's woven throughout everything we're doing, but I can give you an example. Um, talking to a teen client about being nervous about performing in something, let's say it could be a sport or it could be a, an academic, you know, performance, like they have to be in some competition or give a speech. And in the, before I learned the daring way, I would have probably encouraged them, you're going to do a great job. Like, what are you afraid mm-hmm. of? How can you overcome those fears? But after learning the daring way, I talked to them about even if you don't get a good grade or even if you fail, the worst that you can imagine, that you did it. You went out there. You put yourself out there and how valuable that is. And just kind of taking – Taking it from the good, bad, failure, success to it's brave to stand up in front of people when you're scared and you do it anyway. 
That is That's the beautiful. accomplishment. That is absolutely beautiful. It also goes back then, I guess in my mind, the that internal reward versus the external reward. And yeah, as you're saying, yeah, not it's not a good or a bad. Absolutely. It's like, look at you. You showed up. You did it. You had courage. You were brave. That's it. Yeah. And it really doesn't matter what the outcome is because this is us going through life you know, all these constructs about what your job is and how much status you have and power and stuff, that's all made up. I mean, really what life is, is are you going through it? Are you learning and growing, challenging yourself, pushing yourself, you know, and and just living a life that's fulfilling and meaningful. And that's a lot different from what our culture really tells us about, you know, Right. Achievement and what we're supposed to be. Absolutely. So, and I couldn't have even, I don't think I would be, allow myself to be vulnerable enough to say something like that in a therapy session before I Mm -hmm. did as the therapist, before I learned the daring way, because I identified through, because it's an experiential um, training, I did the model as a, as a client, you know, and I realized that I had some barriers to allowing myself to be vulnerable in a therapy session. I felt like I have to have the answers and I have to be look like unrattled and cool. And I mean, there's even some shame around the idea of wanting to appear cool because it's like, (laughs) that is how we feel, but we don't want people to know we feel that way. It's like, you're either cool or you're not. Don't try to be cool. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, everyone's trying to be cool. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, just being able to even look at that and realize that the more I've allowed myself to be vulnerable and be authentic, not in a way where my client's taking care of me in the session, mm-hmm. but I can show that I'm human. It's much more relatable for clients and they feel more comfortable and they can go to a place that. I couldn't have helped them get to before because I wasn't there. So it really did change me and it made me a better clinician. And it gives me a whole set of tools to use with clients that I didn't know I needed. Yeah. And it's, I love it. it. Yeah. And I just, I've I've been nodding my head a lot through this (laughs) conversation, but I love also there's a, I think sometimes as therapists, there's a, a perceived uh, belief out there that, yeah, we've, we're perfect, right? Mm-hmm. And we don't have our own kind of blocks. And so well, that's what, kind of what we were hoping everyone would think, right? Right, right. <laughs> and what you're talking about, though, is again, we're all human. And when we do that inner work and look at that and go, oh, we do become better clinicians. And that also then it can empower the clients too, because it allows we can go deeper with them. So they can go deeper in their own lives, which again, continues that ripple effect of how they they work as parents or connect with loved ones and friends and create that more authentic life that they're looking for and craving. Exactly. Because I've been a therapy client before, and I definitely thought my therapist had never experienced any of the problems <laughs> or yeah. you know, doubts or anything that I was going through. And then that made me feel like, oh, you know, I'm this person who's so flawed and I need you, this expert, to help me, you know, with my bad problems because I'm just not that good, you know. And instead of, hey, you're a person who has Mm -hmm. some skills and training and um, hopefully you can relate to my experience and help me make sense out of it. You know, that's a lot different. That is, yeah. Yeah, relate and be able to, yeah, provide that support that I'm looking for. Um, versus you, you're the, you're the expert and you know, everything. Cause my philosophy is, you know, the person that comes or the clients that come into my office is they're honestly the expert. I'm there to help support and guide them. Um, and look, look underneath what that, that belief is that they're not, they're not enough. Exactly. Yeah. And helping them see how that r- belief might be getting in their way because mm-hmm. it's something that they're just not noticing and, you know, little blind spots of helping them just shine a little light on it. Yes. Yes. Hmm. Good stuff. Oh my. 
So I guess one of the last things that I have is, is there a book or I guess a piece of advice that you, whether it's working with the individual person or with parents or with the teens that you sometimes will recommend or talk to them about? You've, you've done throughout the, the interview today, I mean, there's been great pieces of advice and feedback that you know I've heard you give clients and it really sounds like um, empowers them. And I'm curious if there's anything um, in particular that you typically recommend. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I recommend now to, well, it's two things, but they sort of go together to almost all of my clients is mindfulness. So getting grounded and present, being in the present moment, because perfectionism is about you're not really in the present moment. You're thinking, what is everyone thinking of me? Was everyone, you know, how do I look? What am I measuring up? And instead of right now in this moment, I am here with my friend and I'm talking and, you know, (laughs) just being being present. So (laughs) mindfulness is a big one as a part of mindfulness, a self-compassion practice. It's, um, it's, it's really been transformative for me and I strongly believe, and I learned this through the daring way that you, you are separate from others when you're judging them. Mm -hmm. And so judging creates disconnection and separateness. It's like that that person and I are different. So either I'm better or they're better in some way. Mm -hmm. Thus, (laughs) um, (laughs) you're judging yourself. So the way you judge yourself gets in the way of you being able to accept others. So self-compassion is accepting yourself, accepting our own common humanity that we're all, we all struggle, we're all suffering in different ways, or we do suffer at various times. And it's just part of being human Mm -hmm. rather than I have all these problems and I'm screwed up, but you know, I'm the only one. So when you can use self-compassion to really have much more acceptance of yourself and of the emotions that you experience, then you will be more accepting and compassionate towards other people. And it's, it's just something that happens very naturally. And it's so beautiful because when you see that we're all connected, there's, there's a loving feeling about that. And the feeling of disconnection creates fear, distrust, Mm -hmm. you know, isolation, just all the problems of the world. So I feel very strongly that Self-compassion is a key to connectedness, you know, of each person around the world. Yes, absolutely. And I I totally understand that. Yeah, mindfulness and self-compassion, they really do go hand in hand, um, yeah, to create that. So, oh, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for being here today and for discussing this and then sharing it with um, everyone out there in the world about how The Daring Way and just Brene Brown's work not only has impacted you as a person, as a clinician, as a parent, and also how it can work for them in their lives and empower them and to be more authentic, create more loving connections and feel like they belong. I love it. Absolutely love it. Oh, Nicole, you're welcome. It was so fun. Thank you for this great discussion. Thank you for listening to Launching Your Daughter with Nicole Burgess, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist. For more information or to stay up to date, go to launchingyourdaughter.com. You can sign up for my email list or join my Facebook group. Thank you.